Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. In this week's podcast, I have tidbits, I have some gifts from viewers, and I have a finished sweater that I wanna show you. If you'd like to jump right to a specific point in the video, tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen and use the chapter titles to guide you to the starting point of the desired section. Use the gear icon to slow down or speed up playback. So let's get started. This first tidbit came to me from Mary who sent me a message on Ravelry. She said, while watching a World War II movie with my hubby, I got excited when there was a scene of ladies knitting. The movie was released in 1942, and given your interest in learning from the past to inform the knitting of today, perhaps there's something new or interesting you can glean from the footage, technique or equipment, etc. So she included a link to the movie. Uh, which I will put down in the show notes. Uh, the movie is called In Which We Serve, and it was produced in the UK and in 1942, as mentioned before. So the link that I'm gonna put in the show notes, if you click on it, it will take you right to that specific point in the movie, but you could always go back to the beginning and watch the whole movie if it's something that's, that's interesting to you. The knitting style that these women are displaying in this movie is one that I, think became popular in the Victorian era in the early to, to mid 19th century when knitting items other than stockings or baby garments became much more commonplace. So the Industrial Revolution at the start of the 19th century began with all sorts of innovations in textiles and materials related to textiles, which includes high quality commercially milled yarn. And as a result, knitting was an activity that was taken up by women of the rising middle class. So it was something they could do that was seen as productive and industrious and useful to their families, but it wasn't something that they were doing to earn money. So the specific knitting style these women are seen using in the movie, I have sometimes heard called parlor style because it was the style of knitting if you were sitting in a parlor chatting or, or just working. And the way that they're holding the right hand needle is often called the pencil hold. So I have this giant knitting needle here, but I'll put it right here. You can see it's in between the thumb and forefinger. And so it was kind of balanced like this on the hand. Now, it's kind of a, a weird position, if you, especially if you're like me and you're used to holding things more like, like a knife like this. But years ago, I took a class from Stephanie Pearl McPhee, the yarn harlot, and the class was on knitting for efficiency. And she mentioned that one of the reasons for this style becoming common had to do with not exposing the palm of your hand outward as you knit and being able to keep it facing your own body. So if I'm holding this needle, the palm, the palm is facing toward me. And she mentioned that when you see like the aristocracy waving to the public, they're, they're always keeping their palm facing towards themselves. Well, production knitters, so knitters who earned money from their knitting would have used the most efficient method available rather than being concerned about exposing their palms. And so they were be more likely to do something like having a needle in um, like a knitting belt so it was anchored, leaving their hand free um, to move the yarn like this and their hand would have, their palm would have been exposed outward. Now I would love to find a 19th century knitting book or some sort of source that explicitly states something about knitting styles and which methods are favored and, and to see what sort of explanation that they give for why it might be favored. Mostly what I have seen in 19th century knitting books has been talking about just the English method versus the German method, which is what we call the continental method, holding the yarn in the left hand. And I haven't seen anything that talked about different styles of knitting with the yarn in the right hand. But sometimes it's just really hard to find things in writing that were part of the widely known culture. So if anybody has seen anything in one of those old digitized 19th century books or, or articles or something that explains why 
uh, knitting in this particular way would be more desirable. I would love to see a source like that. This tidbit came to me from Anne Marie and she sent me a message that says, a tidbit that may be of interest to you, I came across this clue in my morning crossword. Indulgence in aimless thought, and then in parentheses, four dash nine. So the answer was wool gathering. So a four letter word with a nine letter word. This made me curious, of course, and a quick Google search brought up this article from Oxford University Press. So I will leave that link to the article that she's talking about down below. It's written by an etymologist. So it turns out that the phrase refers to women and children who had the task of wandering around the fields picking small bits of wool from the hedges. It was considered to be an absent-minded pursuit to no good purpose. The author of the article that I'm linking below begs to differ. So I recall in a, in a tidbit from sometime in the past year or so, there was uh, a TV show from the 70s. So it was a very popular presenter. If somebody grew up in the 70s, they would have known him. And this particular episode of his show was about Dorset Buttons and the history of Dorset Buttons. And they talked about how the whole family got involved in this activity of producing buttons at home. One of the tasks involved in producing these buttons involved sending children out to gather wool from the hedges like this. And then that wool was in turn used in some way in the production of these buttons. So um, very much a did have a purpose. There was definitely a goal to going out and wool gathering. But again, I will leave the link to that article down below. This tidbit is just an announcement about an online event. This is the University of Glasgow's Fleece to Fashion Conference. So for the past couple of summers, I have attended this conference via Zoom because they did not have an in-person version of it. And what happened was they just opened it to anybody in the world and people from all, hundreds of people from all over the world attended this conference. So what this conference is, is a presentation of papers or of research that um, people involved in academia who are studying you know, like fashion history or material culture, things like that, they present the, the things that they are currently researching. And it can be really, really interesting. This year, the conference is a hybrid in-person in Zoom. So you can still attend it and it's still for free. Uh, and I will leave a link to um, so you where you can register uh, through Eventbrite if you're interested. From their website, this is what they have to say. This free conference will focus on the processes and practices associated with the production of knitted textiles from home hand and machine knitting to factory production. Glasgow is an internationally recognized city of the creative arts and crafts, and Scotland has a global reputation for the quality and style of its knitted textiles. Panels will address the themes of creativity in the use of design, materials, and techniques, authenticity of materials and practices, and sustainability of production methods. These themes have always been critical features of the success of Scotland's knitters, designers, entrepreneurs, and business owners, from the lace knitters of Shetland to the global companies of the 21st century. And this conference aims to interrogate the diverse ways in which this sector has been inspired, supported, and manifested, from the home knitter to the internationally renowned designer and everything in between, not only in Scotland, but also internationally. So I, again, I have attended this conference in the past two years since the pandemic began and I've enjoyed it uh, every time. They do have it timed in such a way that if you are here in the United States, you don't have to get up at four in the morning in order um, to attend it. So that is really wonderful. So again, that Eventbrite link will be down in the show notes. Okay. Okay, so let's see what is in here. Ah, 
Oh, this is a book called Scandinavian Knitwear. I actually just saw somebody talking about this on Instagram. Oh, it's an Alice Starmore book. Uh, the research was conducted in 1978, uh, which is really nice. The copyright 1982, so the 80s were really big on publishing books of all, all sorts within knitting, particularly as it pertains to uh, traditional knitting. So uh, this is really cool. I have a couple of Alice Starmore books already, more ones that have to do with Erin knitting. So this will be really interesting to, to see this book and what she has to say about Scandinavian knitting. So that is really cool. So thank you so much, Karina. I really appreciate it. That was so nice of you uh, to send this to me. Thanks so much. Oh, this is really cool. Oh, I think I remember somebody telling me they were going to send this a while back. America's Knitting Book. Let's see, this was published in 1968. And the inside cover says this is, ooh, the little spider, my little spider friend. Here is the knitting book for everyone, for the beginner, for the occasional knitter, for the experienced knitter. All types of hand knit garments are discussed. So I have not heard of this book. So this is uh, so this is a really cool. This is something I have not seen before. So thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate it. That was so nice of you to send this. So both of these books are going to be great additions to my uh, vintage uh, knitting book library. So that is fantastic. Thank you so much to both of you. So I'm going to stand up um, straighter so that you can see the difference. But I have finished my reverse engineered sweater. This is the original commercially knit sweater. I had a big stain right here. Uh, and this sleeve right here, big hole in it. So it ha it's at least 20 years old, if not older than that. And I wanted to recreate it with some differences. So the most obvious differences are that the color, of course, is different, and that I made a change to the way that the pockets uh, look. And I also mirrored the cables on the front of the sweater. On the back of the sweater and the sleeves, I kept the cables as they originally were. Everything crossed to the right originally in the original sweater, as you can see, um, and I did make that change. So uh, let me stop slumping. <laughs> And I will give you a view of what the sweater looks like um, from all angles. Let me pick up my microphone. So I am pretty happy with it. This yarn has um, some mohair in it, which I think is giving the, the yarn a little bit of more grip. This is a very drapey yarn. And so I'm probably going to uh, block this again and um, in order to make the, the hips a little wider. It's not too tight, but it does want to kind of um, pull the button band a little bit. And I'd rather just have it be a little bit roomier. I, I don't think that's gonna be a problem. I've done that before for blocking the sweater as it is. I just soaked it and then I laid it flat. I didn't try to shape it into any dimensions. The next time I block it, I will just make sure that I give myself a little bit more room. It's not too tight, but it does fit the, the rear end and I just assume that it'd be a little bit uh, looser around, around there. But otherwise, I'm uh, pretty pleased with the way this turned out. Uh, so let me sit down and face the camera so you can see my face and I'll talk a little bit more about the journey I went through on this sweater. So this has been kind of a long journey uh, getting the sweater to the finish line. I 
first started working on reverse engineering this, I think it was a couple of years ago. I'll link to the videos that are the video I did. I think, again, I think it was two years ago where I actually showed how I kind of measured everything and how I evaluated what was going on in the sweater. Um, but I ran into a problem uh, when I decided there was a change that I wanted to make. So anytime you are reverse engineering something, you really need to think about what is it that I'm trying to replicate? Am I trying to replicate this thing exactly? Or am I trying to replicate certain aspects of it? Or if I'm, am I just trying to get the same vibe? And for me, what I wanted was the silhouette, the shape of the sweater, the length of the sweater, the fact that it was a V-neck cardigan, it had pockets. And I wanted to knit it with this particular type of cable. I thought it was an interesting um, cable and I hadn't done one quite like that before. So those were the things I was primarily uh, interested in. And then when I actually started looking at it up close and saw the details of how it was actually created in the factory, I could see what techniques were being used, what specific stitch patterns, what uh, stitch count. I was measuring the gauge of um, the stitches and all that kind of thing. And so that's when I had to make decisions about, well, obviously I can't replicate it 100% exactly. I don't have access to the yarn, but I do know what the fiber content is. I can see the construction of the yarn and I can measure the gauge and I, and I can use that information and then make decisions. So this original sweater right here uh, was an Aran weight sweater. So that's a little bit heavier than a worsted weight yarn. And it, it was worked at like four to four and a half stitches per inch in the stockinette. Um, so it's a little heavier than I normally use for a sweater. I find Aran weight a little bit harder to get a hold of here in the US. Worsted weight, well, is very easy to find and I tend to have several sweaters worth of worsted weight yarn in my stash. So it was close enough, but I was gonna need to change the stitch count because I'm using a thinner yarn and therefore I would be using smaller stitches. So I had to, to figure out how to convert the original cable pattern with the number of stitches that were used for that into one that would work uh, with the yarn that I was using. So I had to play a little bit with stitch counts. So I wanted to keep you know, the panels that were the same width and, and, um, and that sort of thing. So I wanted something that pretty much really looked on first glance as if it were the same sweater. There were some things that I didn't care about one way or another, didn't, didn't matter to me, and I looked to see what was used in the original and then thought about, is that what I wanna use? There was Knit 2 Pearl 2 ribbing, I, which is my favorite, I'm gonna use that. I could see they used a tubular cast on, which is very common in commercially knit items. And so I use something very similar to a tubular cast on. It's called an alternating cast on. And I used a version for Knit 2 Pearl 2 that works really well, that doesn't cause the stitches to kind of skew to one angle or another, which is typical with tubular. There are certain things that I hadn't noticed. And when I actually looked, I went, oh, that's interesting. That would be interesting to replicate, to see if it would work. Like, the brioche button band. I said last week that I was giving up on the brioche button band and I spent one day knitting a very large amount of Knit One Pearl One ribbing. I decided to give the look at the brioche one more time and was it as bad as I thought it was? And it wasn't. <laughs> so I thought I'm just going to continue with the brioche band and I'm glad I did. I think it does look nice. It looked really great in the original sweater. I really like it. So I kept that. One of the things that I didn't like about the original sweater was that the cables all went in the same direction. It's very typical of commercially knit uh, garments, particularly when it's such a plain 
cable that's repeated over and over and over and over again. This is not like a complex Aran sweater with a lot of different types of cable patterns, different widths of panels, none of that. It's very repetitive and so it's very common to do that. But I looked at the sweater and I thought, well, I would like the cables to mirror each other on the front. Very simple process. And the difficulty came with trying to figure out how to mirror them on the back. And that's really what kept me, what stopped me in my tracks, uh, was trying to figure out what I can do up the middle here so that I could mirror these on either side. And this past spring, I really I spent some time thinking about the simplicity of these cable pa panels and the fact that what I normally do when I'm mirroring is with much more complex patterns with a much wider center panel that becomes the focus. And this would not be the focus. Certainly would be possible to mirror these cables by putting something very plain up the middle, but I didn't think that would serve the design. So my decision was to keep all of the cables crossing as they originally did which looked perfectly fine, um, but mirroring them on the front because I did think that with the V-neck having the cables um, coming toward the V-neck on both sides uh, was a better it was uh, a better look than having one coming toward the V-neck and then one going away, which is what the original sweater was like. The other thing that I changed was I changed sort of um, the vertical placement of the cables where they originally first crossed, which allowed me to create, you know, this whole uh, sort of lozenge look that the cable has across the front of the pocket. And then um, this is where I decided to put some color in. I had wanted to incorporate red into the sweater in some way from the very beginning. I knew I wanted to make that change. And I spent a long time trying to figure out how I was going to do that. And I finally decided just having it as the pocket lining and then creating this uh, I cord across, which kind of mirrors the ropes of the cables, but in a different color, um, really sort of maintain the simplicity of the design while also adding a little bit more impact. Once I decided to do that, I'd had an idea from the very beginning that I wanted to have something interesting with the buttons. I love buttons on a cardigan and doing something interesting. And so last week I was showing you that uh, what the idea that I'd had from the beginning and then I just then I figured out a way to make it work just like I had hoped uh, was to use two buttons, a red button on the bottom with a black button on top and um, it just gives that little bit of extra color right there. You can see that I really like this color red because it's the, the same color um, that this uh, turtleneck is in. So I did make changes and when I looked very closely inside the sweater to see what techniques were used, how things were shaped, then I made the decision about, do I wanna try that? That's something I hadn't tried before. I'm gonna try it and see how it works out. So one of the things that was different from what I'm used to is that this sweater is actually sort of a hybrid of a drop shoulder sweater, meaning that sides that just go straight up and a set in sleeve sweater, which is the more tailored uh, way of creating sweaters. So if you, if you don't know what a drop shoulder sweater is, I do, I've been doing a series on my Technique Tuesday videos uh, the past couple of months on different styles of sweater, uh, which I'll link to above so you can see what a drop shoulder sweater is. I'll be doing set in sleeve sweater next. So if, you, if you're still not sure what differences are, maybe it'll be a little bit clearer. Um, so the way that this area was shaped was rather than having anything bound off and then having shaping, which would be typical for a set in sleeve, this just went into the decreases. So there was shaping there, but there wasn't this bind off and then shaping. And then for the sleeve cap, a similar thing. There was no bind off and then shaping. It was just the shaping. And it's a pretty wide cap as well. So it, it was a different approach than I'd used before and I was interested in trying it. I obviously knew it worked okay in a sweater because I had been wearing the original sweater for years. 
I don't think if I were designing from scratch that I would have chosen to do it that way. Um, but I'm glad I tried it and have been exposed to a new uh, way of designing. So that's one of the really interesting things about reverse engineering something and really examining what's going on is seeing what was done and then seeing if you can figure out why would they have done it that way. Like what what would be the reason um, for doing that? One of the things that's really common in commercially knit sweaters is that the ribbing is knit at a very, very tight gauge, like way tighter than you could probably do in hand knitting. Um, and because of that, because it's so tight, they have to use a lot more stitches than they would use if it, they were hand knitting. So at the transition between the ribbing and the body of the sweater, there is generally some decreases as the stitches get larger in order to compensate for that. So that was something that I could see in the original sweater and then I had to, uh, I had to make a change there. I couldn't possibly knit as tightly as they had in their ribbing. And so I instead um, kept my stitch count more uh, similar, exactly the same as what it was for the body of the sweater, using the same needle size in order to also keep that bottom as a little bit looser than um, what it might be because it was down otherwise because it, it was going to be down around the hips. It was an interesting process and it really also showed me that anytime you try to make a change or, or want to make a change to something that there's usually a cascading effect. There's usually some consequence to making that change that you might not have thought of. So like this issue of wanting to mirror the cables uh, had the effect of, well, how am I going to handle the mirroring in a different part of the sweater? Or if I make this change, if I don't knit the, the ribbing as tight as they did on the machine because I physically can't, how am I going to compensate that uh, for that in another way? You know, reverse engineering, as I said, can mean a lot of different things to different people. It could be just an impression like, oh, I really love that sweater. I want to replicate that. And maybe what you want to replicate is just that, oh, it's an oversized sweater in bulky knit and it's green. Uh, maybe that's what you want to do and you don't care about exactly replicating stitch for stitch, whatever the original was. So um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, really, and I'm really looking forward uh, to wearing it a lot this coming winter as the weather gets colder. So I wanted to show a couple of details up close that I mentioned. The cast on of the original sweater, you can see right here, it's Knit 2 Pearl 2 uh, ribbing and the edges kind of skew off. That is just uh, something that happens with a Knit, knit 2 Pearl 2 tubular cast on because of the way the stitches are originally constructed. They tend to skew off like that. Uh, I, of course, as I mentioned, couldn't knit mine as tightly, but I could use a cast on that June Hemmons Hyatt calls the alternating Knit 2 Pearl 2 cast on, and it tends to look less skewed um, than a standard uh, tubular cast on wood. So I really like this cast on for uh, knit to Pearl 2 uh, ribbing uh, if I need to create something that looks like a tubular cast on. The other thing that I wanted to show up close was uh, the buttons. These buttons have a slight dome shape and I just stacked them on top of each other and you can see kind of that space between the base of the black one and the base of the red one. And then I realized it's sort of like stacking layers of cake and that in order to get something that's nice and flat, you actually need to put the flat surfaces next to each other. I didn't bother taking this one out and re-sewing it because the, the problem is really with the sewing them on. When you have uh, the black one trying to balance on this curved surface of the red one, it's a real pain to try to sew on. But for the other ones, I, I put them with the flat surfaces next to each other. It wouldn't work for all types of buttons, but the, this button is the same color on the right side as it is on uh, the wrong side. So it worked just fine. And, and having those two flat surfaces together made it much easier to line up the holes as well. 
So, and I did that sort of thread shank in order to create space between the base of the button and the fabric so that when the button is buttoned that there's you have room between the button and the thick fabric um, of the button hole band so that the button will lie on top and not be like super tight and pressed into it. So I didn't mention at all my 1970s vintage sweater project uh, in the intro. And so in case you're wondering, I am pretty much done with the entire body of the sweater and I will be ready to um, bring the shoulders together and cut the steaks open and, and do all that kind of thing. So I will give a more thorough update on that. Uh, this week, most of this week was spent just knitting, 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 knitting the body um, and really focusing on finishing my reverse engineered sweater. But just in case you're wondering if I've made any progress, I have, and you'll hear more about that next week. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.